Hey everybody, welcome back to Train Enable, where we help struggling gym goers become fit, happy, and confident through custom workouts. Today we're gonna play an interview that I did with a doctor of physical therapy and a good friend of mine, Jesse Lewis. So without further ado, let's get into all things home workouts. All right, what's up everybody? Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Jesse Lewis. I am the owner of District Performance and Physio, physical therapy company in DC. Um, you know, with the lockdown going on, we've had a ton of questions on how to stay healthy, mobility, strength, all these questions. Um, and one of the best resources I can point you guys to is definitely Kyle. He's about to introduce himself in a second. Uh, but us getting together, um, I really appreciate him coming on. And we're going to talk everything at home fitness. Kyle, what's up? Cool, man. I appreciate you, Jesse. So Jesse and I met through Petworth Fitness and... He was super gracious and he like gave me a free consult because I had some like nagging injuries and he fixed me up right away and it was like really non-stress. Um, so if you guys ever have anything going on with you and you need to have something looked at, Jesse's the dude to go to. But a little bit about myself. Um, I have been in organized sports my entire life. I ran track and field all the way through the collegiate level and we were back-to-back -back state champs two years in a row. And when I graduated, I didn't really have anything to fill like that void that, you know, going to practice left. So I started getting into the realm of like functional fitness and then I kind of got into Olympic weightlifting. Then I got into coaching. So I've been coaching for almost a decade now. And I've managed two gyms, one in California, one in uh, D.C. now called Petworth Fitness. Um, and then within the last year, I started my own online remote coaching business where we target folks who are struggling to have a consistent, healthy workout routine because we think everybody should be fit, happy, and confident. So we provide custom tailored workouts to hopefully lead you in that direction. So that's kind of myself, what I do, um, and how I hopefully can be here to help you guys. Very cool. Uh, I don't, did you mention what's your, uh, what's your remote coaching company's name? Yeah, so it's called Train and Able, kind of like a spin on Cane and Able. So instead of it being A B E L, it's L E. Very cool. Got it. All right, so let's just dive into it. So, you know, let's start with like a broad topic and just say, you know, what's the biggest question or concern or complaint you've had people ask, you know, in the past two months since we've all been locked down about at home workouts? Yeah, so I think it really boils down to a lack of equipment. People think that they need to have um, a barbell or they need to have a rower or a treadmill or an elliptical or insert any type of traditional training tool. Um, because obviously now we're confined to our own homes. People, it seems, have forgotten that fitness doesn't have to be fancy in order to work. All you have to do is just do something strenuous and I like to keep it short, hard, and fast. So whatever that is. Um, so if you do jumping jacks fast enough and for long enough, you're going to start feeling like you're getting a workout in. So I say my biggest advice to folks now is don't be afraid to do something simple because simple doesn't mean easy. So you don't need to overcomplicate it. So lack of equipment doesn't mean that there's going to be a lack of progress. So that's probably like my number one. Um, question I get is like some iteration of that. Or like, what can I do with X? Or since I don't have Y, what should I do instead? And I think there's kind of a lack of knowledge is like what movements we normally do in the gym and what is like a good carryover for like body weight or um, like lighter loading options for those kind of like replacement exercises. Right. Uh, that's, uh, that, that brings up a good question. I'm, I'm going to bring it up later about like, what can people substitute for certain movements? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I kind of feel the same way. I think to play off of that a little bit, I think one of the most common things I've heard is that people are stressed out or worried that they're like not doing the right type of workout or, you know, it's not, is this good enough or should I do this or should I do that? And kind of the same philosophy of you is like, just don't, don't stress so much. Um, <clears throat> you know, doing something is better than nothing. So don't worry if it's like the perfect workout or, you know, is it the best possible workout you could be doing? If you're doing something, 
listen, you're winning right now. So, so don't overthink it. You know, like Kyle said, like doing something simple, doing 50 jumping jacks is better than sitting there stressed out about doing nothing. So, so I really love the, the keep it simple approach. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I would say like my biggest tip that I personally employ is I've never been like a good warmer upper, you know, like I just want to kind of get straight into it, but I know from like experience and like the science behind it and like having a pretty good coaching background, like the warm up is probably the most important part of your workout. But when you're already at home, you're not actively like partaking in traveling to the gym. So you're not having that kind of like time to start getting in the mindset of like, all right, I'm going to start working out. What I do instead is to just get in and get out is I'll kind of create a loose plan of like, this is what I'm trying to target today. So I'll take the first five minutes of the workout. I'll just get straight to it, but I'll intentionally hold back and use that kind of as like my warm up period. So I'm not doing like any passive stretching or anything like that, but I'm also not going like zero to a hundred out of nowhere because then that's when I'm kind of putting myself at danger, but it's a great way to just kind of like trick yourself. Like, yo, we're already moving. So you might as well just keep it rolling and then you can just kind of ramp up the intensity from there. And that's a quick way to just get in, get out, do something better than nothing. No. Yeah. I think I love that because like, most of like from a medical perspective, most of the research shows that like passive stretching doesn't really lead to any performance gain. It doesn't really lead to any injury um, prevention. So, you know, don't like how like, you don't need to do any passive stretching when you warm up. So don't overthink your warm up. Like Kyle said, like, let's say your warm up or let's say your workout has, I don't know, squats and lunges in it. Your warm up can be your first 10 squats are half depth of what you normally are. And you just start to work a little bit lower. Same thing for lunges. Um, so your warm up doesn't have to be this huge, fancy, perfect 15, 20 minute thing that you're targeting every single muscle group perfectly. Like Kyle said, just, just ease into your workout a little bit and then start to ramp yourself up as you go. Um, you know, don't go zero to a hundred, like he said, but you also don't need to like stress yourself out and say, I got to do this 15 minute warm up before I do whatever I'm doing. Yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, what would you say your philosophy was for workouts? Fast, hard, what was it? Yeah, short, hard, and fast. Short, hard, and fast, perfect. So how long do you, like, for all these at-home workouts, you know, how long are you telling people that their their sessions should be? What do you, what do you think, like, the minimum should be? So, like, I'm going to try not to nerd out too much, but there's, like, you know, uh, energy pathways within the system, and, like, your body starts to pull um, different fuels from different places and all that. So to kind of encapsulate the majority of those energy systems, I usually say between like eight to 15 ish minutes, you'll get kind of broad spectrum, right? You get a little bit of like a sprint start and then you kind of get like a big parabolic curve at the, at the center. And then you kind of get into um, those longer ranges as you come to the end. So I would say, you would probably be best served to stay around like 10 to 12 minutes of some really decent effort. And I think a lot of times people fail to correlate like pace into that. Like they don't, they don't really consider that. So the pace of like a five minute workout is going to be way different than the pace of like a 15 minute workout. So just because it doesn't feel exhausting right from the get go, doesn't mean that you're not, um, getting a good response from your system. So warm up and cool down excluded, which I like to do five to 10 minutes of each kind of bookending, um, my workout eight to eight to 20 minutes is probably plenty. As long as you're keeping those kind of rules of keeping a short, hard and fast. Okay. Yeah. So how do you, you know, what, how would you give someone advice if they're not sure, are they going hard enough? Are they going fast enough? Like how does someone know that? Yeah. I mean, like kind of the traditional signs of like localized fatigue or like, uh, I, I, I don't really like using the term like a burning sensation cause that can kind of misguide, mislead people, but whatever muscles are being used, like example squat, obviously it's a pretty, hopefully a leg dominant exercise. If you start feeling your legs 
weaken or, you know, you're out of breath or you can feel your pulse in your neck. That's probably some good indicators that you're approaching a pretty decent power output. Because if I'm, and like an example I like to give people is if I told you to walk a mile, you'd probably be fine at the end. If I told you to sprint a hundred meters and you only have 10 seconds to do it, that is a, a much shorter distance, but your power output is much higher. So a lot of the time it's not what we do, but how we do it. So over the course of whatever your workout is, if you end feeling sweaty, you're breathing heavy and you can feel your pulse um, elsewhere, like your head's throbbing, feel it in your neck, something like that. Those are probably good signs that you've worked sufficiently. Yeah, I think uh, I like I like that simple approach. Like going back to what we talked about at the beginning, like you don't have to overthink your workout. It doesn't have to be perfect. If you feel like you got a good workout, great, you su you succeeded, good job. Uh, so don't you know? Don't worry. Is it this perfect workout, or did I get every single muscle group or not? Um, you know, just do do something where you feel like you worked, and then you can build off of that. Um, so so I like that. Um, so there's a couple of people that just joined. Um, welcome. First of all, thanks for joining. Uh, just a heads up, we are recording this, but the way it records is it only records the person speaking. So if you don't join in, if you don't turn your video on, if you don't talk, you're not going to be recorded. Don't worry. We would love questions. So if you guys have questions, um, throw them in the chat. We're happy to answer them there. Um, I'll open it up to questions in a minute here. Uh, I got one more question for Kyle here. Um, and then I'll, I'll open up to any questions anybody might have. Um, so Kyle, one thing I like to do when I program workouts for people is I love like interval work, especially right now at home is like interval workouts and, and breaking it up in body parts. So like push up, squats, sit ups, so that you can have that like constant hard push, but you're giving your legs a break while you're doing sit ups or, or whatever. What do you think about that type of workout? Yeah, I think there's kind of two key pieces that are very nuanced in like a workout like that. So first off, you're you're working within a time frame. There's no set uh, rep range that you're trying to achieve. So inherent in that, the more fit folks are going to do more work within that same time period. Those who are, you know, recovering from injury or just starting their fitness endeavor, they're going to do less within that same time frame. So it's, it's safe for everybody to, to work within that. Um, and it's also like a good way to limit yourself. Like, let's say you've gone five days in a row and you're not feeling all that great. You're like, I'm just going to move for 30 seconds doing this. You know, that can look drastically different depending on how you feel because Generally, that changes day to day or sometimes even hour to hour. So that's a, a big positive in doing kind of like interval style training. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, which is also good, is kind of like breaking up to localized muscle groups. So like we're going to do um, a midsection dominant movement and we're going to do a lower body dominant movement and then like an upper body or back or whatever you want to think of like that. That ensures that we're not exhausting or you know building up a huge amount of fatigue in a in a certain muscle group because then that's when you can get strains or tears or just like your soreness is just so high you feel useless um, and for folks who are newer to working out it's kind of hard to distinguish whether they're really sore or they're actually hurt so i generally like if i had the ideal like split if you want to think of it um, like how you split your work workout days and your rest days as a beginner, I would probably go every other day just because at least you have like a little buffer, but movement is like lotion to the body, right? The more you move, the better you're going to feel, but it doesn't always have to be like a hundred percent effort. So if you can do two days in a row or three days in a row and just kind of self-regulate three days is probably the max that I would like somebody working out in a, in a row. So I would go three on, one day off, two days on, one day off. Because if you build too much fatigue, then that's when you get tired. And a lot of folks don't have heavy equipment or like a lot of equipment. So they end up doing all these repetitive motions that are unloaded so they can do a high volume. 
but you also want to be very careful of like exhausting a certain joint or a certain um, muscle group because that can lead to disaster later on. Um, we got a chat question that goes right off of that, but I just want to say one thing on that. The one thing you mentioned was like taking that rest day. It, I think that's one thing that I have to educate people on more than anything is that you don't actually build strength while you're doing your lunges. You build strength while you take your rest day after you do your lunges. So if you just constantly burn your muscles out the same muscle group day after day after day, you're actually holding yourself back on your progress. So it's super, super important to give yourself a rest day to get that recovery to allow your body to build up. So a lot of times people will think of like a rest day or a recovery day as like a day off. Don't think of it as a day off. Think of it as like you're pushing forward to the next step. Uh, I always give the example. Uh, I was working with a runner one time who was super frustrated that she couldn't hit her PRs. And she came into me medically and was like, what's wrong with me? I didn't even take a look at like her ankles or anything or hips. She thought something was wrong with her ankles. I talked about her training program. She was running seven days a week and cool. she was just never recovering. So it took me like two weeks of trying to convince her to just add two rest days in. And as soon as she added rest days in, she was like PRing like three weeks later. So don't, don't forget about your rest days and recovery days. They are so, so important. Yeah. And I, I think like for, for that very competitive mindset person or somebody who is really focused on like continually moving the needle. Um, think of it as a recovery day rather than a rest day. Cause like you were saying, Jesse rest implies that you don't do anything for that day, but recovery can just, the way that I defined a recovery day or recovery workout would be um, you're able to hold a conversation mid exercise mid movement. So the second that you need to kind of talk like this, that's no longer a recovery day. You've, you're exerting yourself too, too much, but additional blood flow to the body will never be a disservice. Yeah. Great. Um, so we got a couple of awesome questions. Um, so first, I don't know if you can see the chat, but somebody asks, they said they depend on their gym to make sure they get a well-rounded set of workouts through a given week. Um, now that they can't really do that, how do they know if they've hit the right group of muscles often enough or not enough or too much, um, enough cardio versus not enough cardio, upper body versus lower body? Like how do they, how do you know if you're doing the right amount? Yeah. So I would say one thing that's probably not as known for folks who attend a gym, like a functional fitness gym, cross the gym, if you want to think of it like that, or like even a strength and conditioning type gym is they, they are not banking on the fact that people are going to adhere to that three days of working out in a row, one day off, two days working out one day off because everybody lives a little different lives. Everybody has different goals. Um, everybody has different schedules and just availability. So for the most part, we are trying to vary those muscle groups and like time domains and just overall volume and loading to the best of our ability. But also if I gave two people the exact same workout program, their responses could be drastically different for a multitude of reasons, right? Sleep, stress, diet, um, muscle fiber type, if you want to get real nerdy. Um, so I would say you have to kind of take it upon yourself to do some self-evaluation and just kind of feel like, I don't know, I think of it like, did I wake up slow? Like, do I feel like I can't get going throughout the day? Am I extra hungry or am I not hungry at all? Like when you start feeling kind of like out of a routine, that's probably a good sign that you need to take a rest day or you have worked sufficiently. If you have soreness lingering in the same area for like three days plus, that's probably adequate work done in that spot. Or again, you could probably use a rest day or a workout where you're not working those muscle groups. So I wouldn't worry too much about like getting in cardio per se. Cause like if you do squats fast enough, it starts to feel like cardio, right. Versus like traditional running and all that. Um, so if you want to like split it and think like lower body push exercises, pull exercises, or like core one day each, that's probably pretty good. And um, 
if you need like more help deciding like what does a lower body workout look like? What does a push workout look like? What does a pull workout look like? You can always send me an email at Kyle at trainenable.net and I'll be more than happy to kind of like give you a list of what exercises that would look like. Nice. That's awesome. And yeah, just to piggyback off that, like self-evaluating is, is, is a huge piece of that, right? If you're, if your legs are just feeling totally burned out, use that as a sign. Okay. I'm going to back off on legs this week. Um, if you've noticed that a big sign is like, if you notice that your performance is starting to drop. So like you can't do as many squats or you can't do as many pushups as you could last week, you're probably burning yourself out a little bit. Um, so that's a huge key of, that's a huge indicator of, Oh, I might be doing too much. Or if you're a runner and you notice that it's much harder to keep your pace, you might need to back off a little bit. So I think that self-evaluation is key. And then are you getting enough? Like Kyle said, like if you're getting a muscle, if you're getting that muscle group once a week, you're probably doing enough right now. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, diversity of movement. This is super common for a question I've heard. Um, you know, there's only so many squats somebody can do. So what, what's some diff- what are some different options people can have where they're not just squatting 700 times a day? Yeah. I mean, there's, you're only limited by your own creativity. And I think that's kind of what the general population lacks a little bit. And that's no fault of their own because you're not classically trained to exercise as your own coach. Right. And especially folks who have joined a gym or have experience in like some type of organized sports, you're used to walking through the door of the facility and your warm ups there, your workouts there, like, thought has been put into that for you. So you're like, well, this is just what I'm going to do. And now that that's kind of like taken away or less available, um, or you don't have somebody like within the same room as you telling you what to do, folks kind of get lost and they're like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to do squats every day. But even just changing the rate at what you're doing, the movement at can be very beneficial. And it's a very kind of different stimulus that the body feels. So let since we're kind of piggybacking off the squat throughout this talk, it seems like let's say one day you have a workout where you do a hundred squats over the course of it. And then the next day you want to still work the legs because that's what you feel like doing. You can do a much lower volume of squats, but at a differing tempo. So three second descent. So it's a little more controlled. So the muscles having to work longer per rep, And then you can pause in the bottom of the squat for three seconds because now you're um, in a different position for longer unless you don't have a couch and you just sit in the bottom of the squat all day. But even that can be an easy way to not necessarily change an exercise, but to get a different um, impact from it. And there's just like a million resources online. Like if you just go to YouTube and you type in... um, leg exercises without equipment, you will be flooded with options. Yeah. Yeah. Now to get away from that question just for a second, cause I want to uh, touch on something you said, this is something I was going to talk about later with you, but you, you brought it up. So a lot of times people are asking like, how do you build strength without weight? Yeah. Tempo is the key, right? So if you don't have a ton of weight, the way to do it is to take whatever weight you've got and just to do the movement super, super slow. Um, so if, like, like he said for the squat, right. If you don't have a heavy barbell, okay. You take whatever you've got around the house. Let's say you've got a backpack and you can put 20 pounds of water bottles in it, whatever it is. Now you've got a 20 pound backpack on, you do a squat, but you do it super, super slow. Like he said, that's a great way to build strength right now without equipment. Yeah. And I think another thing, like, you're, you're essentially going to start building strength by manipulating some variables and that's load, um, distance traveled per rep, and also just what they call time under tension or how long it's taking you to execute that movement. And your, the, the availability of just changing the way you're doing the movement is not dependent on equipment availability or anything like that. So that's always a good fallback to, to do. Yep. And to get back to your question, 
the answering the question. Another way of varying that stuff is to, you know, you don't have to, you know, don't overthink it. You can make just really, really small changes and totally change the exercise. So for example, if it's a squat one day, hold a dumbbell or a weight, like right here on your right shoulder, only on your right side. Okay. Now you're working your core because you're having to stabilize on one side. The next day you do it on the left side. Now you're working it a little bit differently. The next day you do a squat with your right arm over your head. Okay. Now you've got to stabilize that as you go down. So you can make really, really small changes, but it's at least something different on your body that you're challenging yourself with something else. Um, so there's a ton of, like, like Kyle said, like going to YouTube and just Googling or whatever, Googling leg exercise is a good way to do it. But you can also like just vary the, the basics and still get a, a, a different workout every time. Yeah. And like to, to come back to kind of searching on YouTube, I've, I've since published almost 50 at home workouts where I kind of take the guesswork out of varying the load and the time frames and kind of the, the body parts that you would be targeting. So later on, when we're about to wrap up, I'll give you guys all those resources that you can follow. Um, if that's something that you're, you're interested in. Cool. Uh, just so you guys know, anybody who just joined or had joined late, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, there was stuff Kyle and I were going to talk about, but it, we'd much rather answer questions you guys specifically have. So feel free to, to ask. Um, Somebody said they're working out, but not training. Uh, like she needs more structure and also she's living in an apartment building. So she's afraid to make joy noise. So jumping around is just can't do it or dropping weights or stuff like that. So what, what advice would you give her with that? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people are kind of worries, worried about going outdoors to exercise because you want to keep your, you know, social distancing and all that. And as much as I'm for keeping the space, I think if you are worried about, you know, annoying your next door neighbors or the neighbors who live below you, um, just going into the parking garage, you can easily, you know, do all your work out there. It might not be as comfortable because obviously you're not in the own confines of your home. Um, but that's a, a good way to kind of not be so worried about the noise you're making. Cause if you can't be loud while you're, while you're working out, like when, uh, when else is it socially acceptable to be loud, you know? Um, and then on top of just creating some structure, there are a lot of like, if you want to call them templates that you can think of where, like we kind of alluded to earlier, where you do lower body one day, core one day, push one day, pull one day. There's, a ton of just those very uh, zoomed out programs that you can find on um, on the internet, and that's kind of like the whole the whole reason I started Train Enable was because I found that the biggest barrier people were experiencing when trying to get fit was finding these you know programs you know seeking out a coach who is knowledgeable and then actually just going to the gym because the hardest part about going to the gym sometimes is just going to the gym so if i could remove some of those barriers but still forge like a personal relationship with people i found that advantageous because we we have so much technology and we're blessed with things that we thought were impossible like 15 years ago, you know, like we're all talking in, in the confines of our own home in on the same call. So like those tools are out there and like, that's, that's what I want to make myself available to, to the masses for. Nice. Yeah. And, uh, like on the structure thing, like you can make it like a very simple structure. You could say strength one day, cardio one day, yoga rest, right? You don't like, if you want, if you need to give yourself structure, you can start to keep it simple and then build off of that. But, you know, kind of going back to the very first thing we talked about, the more simple you can keep things right now, I think the more progress you're going to make, um, the more you kind of complicate things and, and, and think about it, you're just going to, make it almost too complicated to even get started. So just, just get started is my biggest suggestion. Yeah. We call that paralysis by analysis. Yep. And it's super, it's super easy right now because all we do, we all, we all have just a million freaking hours a day to think, um, which is terrible. It's like my worst nightmare because all I do is think and it's awful. Um, so I, I get what everybody's thinking, but just get moving. Yeah, totally. And like, I like to think of like graphically represented, 
if you have 365 days a year and you slog through a workout, let's say you do that every single day, that beats the hell out of sitting on a couch, right? And even if you get 1% better every day, I think we could all agree that's pretty marginal, 1%, but you're almost four times the person you were at the end of the year if you adhere to that 1% a day method. Yep. That, like, especially when you see this drawn out, you're like, man, that's huge. Yep. Uh, another question. Um, somebody sitting around way more than they ever had, like everybody else, um, as a physical therapist, this is something I've dealt with way more than anything else is people getting stiff and sore from sitting. So they want to know anything else they can do other than take a walk uh, between or during meetings, uh, like a diversity of movement question. Good question. I answer this literally every single day. Um, my biggest suggestion is every hour, like 45 minutes, get up, depending on your meeting schedule, every 45 minutes, get up. So set a timer on your phone, write yourself a post-it, whatever you need to do to get up, and then pick one different body part to stretch each time. It can be as simple as stretching your shoulders out by reaching up over your head. You can stretch your calf the next hour. You can stretch your hip flexor the next hour, hamstring, like like just stretch something different throughout the day. And if you're getting up every 45 minutes to an hour, boom, now you've done six different body parts that day that you've gotten moving. Uh, walking is totally fine too. Uh, so I would just say like pick one body part and do something for it. It doesn't have to be perfect, whether it's a heel raise or a calf stretch or a hip flexor stretch or a cobra yoga pose. Just pick a different body part and do something different each hour. Yeah. And like when, before I got into the realm of fitness as like my profession, I was working as a financial aid officer in um, the college setting. So I spent a lot of time behind a desk and I was not used to doing that. And my coworker introduced me to the 20, 20, 20 rule. So every 20 minutes, you look 20 feet away from your computer monitor for 20 seconds or longer. So you're not like locked into the same depth of field um, for the whole day. So I'm very ADHD and I need to move around and fidget and do all that stuff. So I adapted that to every 20 minutes, I get up, walk away for 20 seconds or more. And you can easily adapt that to stretch something for 20 seconds. So that way, not only do you find yourself just sitting down all day, but now you've also kind of like been productive and you get kind of like a refreshed energy when you come back to your seat because you don't feel like you're just being absorbed into your couch, you know? Yep. That's good. Um, this is a good question. And I don't, I mean, nobody knows what the answer will look like, but what do you think it'll look like when we get back into the gym? I am kind of concerned that there won't be enough restraint on the participants end to realize that, we have not been handling loads like in, you know, probably not even approaching 50% of our actual like full potential. And now that will be kind of thrusted back into using our traditional training tools that we're going to see a lot of people getting hurt. And then on like the business end, I think if we're not careful in how we're reintroducing people to that and kind of holding them back just through the style of workout we're giving them, um, it could be gnarly. I also think a lot of people are coming to the realization that it was never about the gym. It was more about the, the structure, the quality of coaching, um, and just kind of the atmosphere. Because a lot of times people get, they, they feed off of the environment that they're in. So if they're in like a stale, stagnant, boring workout environment, they're probably not going to be very high energy in their workout. So when you link into a zoom call and you see everyone else moving, right. It's kind of motivating. It's like that, that social pressure that's, that's there and that's positive. So I think we might see a shifting on the gym front to maybe offer more online, um, like personalized programming or to keep the virtual classes. And, and I think it's, it's about time because we've had the internet for so long and like these are only becoming more and more available options to us. And I think those that fail to adopt are going to be losing out on a pretty decent revenue stream and a pretty good reach to reach people. Like everybody nowadays has a computer in their pocket, your smartphone. And if you're not tapping into that, you're losing out on helping a lot of people. 
And again, that's another reason why I, I drove my own business almost entirely online because that's where it's, that's where it's at. Yeah. Uh, you know, back to the first thing you said, like as a physical therapist, like people always want to know why did they get injured? And most of the time we don't know why you got injured, but a huge percentage of the time when I know why it's because they tried to do something they weren't ready for. So for example, like if you're a marathon runner, you can go run 26 miles tomorrow. You'd be totally fine. If you're a power lifter and you go run 26 miles tomorrow, you're going to injure something. It's because you're not prepared for what you're going to do. So if you have been doing at home workouts religiously, and then you go back in the gym and you've been active, that's awesome. It does not mean you can go back to 80% of your old deadlift weight or 80% of your squat weight or whatever. So be super, super cautious and conservative when you go back and totally forget about the weight that you were doing before for every single exercise. We're all going to be starting from scratch and that's okay. You have to be okay with that because if you go back in the gym with the mindset of, I was doing a whatever, 150 pound deadlift before, I want to jump in with 140 pounds, that's when injuries are going to happen. So um, like just, just be super cautious when you go back and be, just be aware that even if you've stayed active, you have to get, let yourself prepare to get back to where you were before. Um, and then also, I don't know if this was the way you were, wanted another question, but what, what will it look like? I mean, I think, you know, from the States that have opened back up, it's going to look like, um, you know, this, this classes are going to be much smaller. We're going to have to stay farther apart. Um, gyms might have to offer more classes to fit the same amount of people in. Uh, you might have a little bit of trouble getting the exact class time that you want because there's only eight to 10 people allowed in a class. Um, because we're all going to, we're not going to be able to fit, you know, 30, unless the gyms, no gym in DC is going to be able to fit 30 people into a class as soon as they open back up. Yeah. I think the, the short answer is nobody knows what it's going to look like. Um, and nobody knows when that is going to be, but I, I find it kind of exciting because I've, I've had long stints to where, like I, I lived in the Netherlands, um, for a year and I couldn't run track and field because I couldn't afford the club fees because I didn't know that it wasn't normal to run organized sports actually through your school. So it's, it's nice to come back because you know, what you're capable of. And if you just put in the work, you can get back to where you were. And like the process is exciting for me, you know, and it's like, you're laying the foundation all over again. When you, when you get to stand back and look at the house you've built, that's cool. But people get lost and like, Oh, I just want it to be done. It's like, no, that's not how it works. Yeah. So we all get, we all, it's leveling the playing field again. That dude who was crushing it and you were chasing him every day or, you know, the girl who always laps you on the treadmill or whatever she's going to be starting from a deficit too. And we're all getting to do it together. And that's, what's cool. I think people are going to be so excited to have contact again. And that's, that's going to be really fun. Yeah. I think the community aspect is going to be like, people are just going to love being back in the gym again. Yeah, absolutely. They're going to be like, I've been seeing my wife for like <laughs> killing me, man. I need, I need someone else. I need another face in here. <sighs> Uh, somebody says drastic change often inspires creation, creativity and innovation. Have you seen that as in your experience as a trainer or business owner over the past six months? I'll let you start. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's definitely the early adopters are going to benefit the most, but it's very easy in times like this to make the wrong move or when people are hypersensitive to a situation, you can rub them the wrong way very easily. And I, I would say not necessarily in like my realm of like physical fitness or like coaching. I haven't really seen too many people doing things that I would deem shady, but I have seen a lot of businesses very successfully navigating, migrating all of their content to a more uh, online format. And some people have already been doing that. So they were like way ahead of the curve. So they're like, big deal, you know? So um, it's, it's a big wheel that turns slow. So I think people are starting to catch on. And I, I still believe that we're right at the beginning of it. But a lot of the people that kind of inspired me to get into fitness have already been doing this for a long time. So 
they're, they're cruising. And I, I kind of wish I, you know, listened to them earlier, but you know, hindsight's always 2020, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think from my end, you know, personally, like my company's entire mission is to keep every person in DC active and exercising if they want to exercise. Um, so when I couldn't put my hands on people again, I was like, Oh shit, what do I do now? How do I still keep doing that mission? So I had to find a way to continue to do that. Um, so it absolutely inspired me and it forced me to do things differently. So instead of doing hands-on sessions, it was, okay, how do I fix someone's back pain over a virtual Zoom call? Um, how do I diagnose somebody's ankle pain that they had that they started last week without being able to put my hands on them? Um, so it kind of forced me to focus on like what I think is most important in physical therapy anyway, which is like the relationship with the person, listening to people, education. Um, so it kind of forced me to get back to the basics of, of what I really do best. But I just, I, it forced me to find, okay, what's a different avenue that I can still do my same exact mission, but in a totally different way. Yeah. And like in some of the seminars I've taken, we, we talk about our, our tool bag, right? So as a coach, you have a couple of different uh, methods to make corrections, like mid movement. So you have uh, verbal cueing, right? Telling people what to do. You have visual cueing, showing them what to do. Then you have tactile cueing. So press into my hand with your knee as you squat. So you're giving them something physical to do. So now that obviously I'm, you know, I'm operating at a disadvantage because I can't put my hands on people. Just like Jesse was saying, it kind of shows you like you've either been putting tools into the bag and you're very good verbally and you're very good at um, displaying things visually, or this is an opportunity for great growth if you're not there. And it's, it's fun to me, like being presented with these challenges because, you know, you get to think critically. And I think the biggest thing that we've been blessed with in this is time and mental bandwidth, you know, because you don't have to sit in traffic. You don't have to sit in the office. You don't have to, you know, interact with so many people. So it's a lot of problem solving going on and a lot of getting back to the basics of more than just business, but just life and being human. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay wants to know, um, what's the best advice to approach strength training as a runner, um, or how to continue and increase strength training during a training block for a race? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, the, a lot of the same principles that you approach like classic strength training, like when you think of like barbell lifts, like squat, deadlift, bench, you can also apply to running. Um, so let's just take distance running for an example. So like running consecutive multiple miles, I think distance runners are guilty at just like sprinters are guilty of getting locked into that one distance. So if I want to crush the Turkey trot 5k and all I'm doing is 5k's like I'm not getting enough variety in like my time domain, my effort, um, to kind of get faster or to feel more comfortable at different effort levels. So I would say one of the best things that you can do is build in some tempo days to where you go through like a variety of different paces or to focus a little bit on speed work. Um, a lot of running is core and like hip flexor dominant. And of course like glute and hamstring. So if you can, maybe do some kind of more classic strength training in those areas like glute, hamstring, hip, uh, core activation that will more than likely translate out on your runs. And even like little things like dialing in your breathing, like if you breathe solely into your lungs, you're, you're kind of losing out on uh, a lot of capacity coming from your diaphragm. So there's a ton of breathing exercises that you don't even need to be running to practice. So there, there's lots of things that you can, that you can vary in. Um, Chris Hinshaw, H I N S H A W. He has his website called aerobic capacity. It's phenomenal. Um, I am not entirely sure. See, so will. I'm not entirely sure, uh, if he put up a pretty aggressive paywall or not, but you can more than likely check that out and, and get a lot of good uh, resources from that. I'll, I'll put it into the chat for you just so you can kind of see it spelt out. 
Yeah. And just to piggyback off that a little bit, um, strength training for runners, like coming from like a person who deals with running injuries all the time and helping people get back from them. Strength training is so, so important, um, both for performance and for injury. Um, Lindsay, just because I know you personally, I'm going to use you as an example. Like when you started introducing strength training into your running programs, like your performance went way, way up. Um, so if you're, even if you're a distance runner or anything, just, you know, make sure you're doing strength training. And then as far as programming with during training blocks, usually as your mileage starts to increase closer to race distance, you might want to decrease the intensity of your leg workouts, but don't totally stop your leg workouts. Yep. You're going to need more time to recover from your distance runs. So then you don't want to like keep burning out your legs. So keep strengthening them, but back off on the intensity or the weight a little bit as your miles increase. Um, all right. We've been going almost an hour. Uh, that went quick. I know it flies. What's that? I said it flies. It went so fast. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, is it true you can't spot reduce fat on certain parts of your body? Uh, hundred percent true. You cannot spot reduce fat on any part of your body. So whether you want to reduce belly fat, whether you want to reduce butt fat, whatever area you want, um, you cannot do it. The way your body does it is it takes it from basically everywhere. There's certain parts that it takes it from first, like your face starts to lose it first, but you cannot control where you start to lose body fat from. You can control where you start to build muscle from though. So you can start to tone up your legs if you want, uh, hips, things like that, but you cannot spot reduce fat. Good question. Uh, any other questions from anybody? All right. Um, Kyle, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you for having me. I'm going to um, just dump some resources into the chat. This is where you guys can find me on all the social media stuff, websites there. Um, yeah, I would love to get in contact with you guys. I have a ton of blog posts on the website. There's those 50 free at home workouts where I give you both the option to use weights if you have them or to do it unweighted. Um, so if you find value in that, love to have you subscribe and just stay in touch. I love hearing from you guys. And I got into this to help people and to create a community and Jesse's doing a fantastic job of that. And I, I also want to kind of insert myself in there and just be part of it. So looking forward to seeing you guys grow. Yeah. Um, same. If you guys want to get in touch with me, feel free. Um, websites, district performance, physio.com, uh, through my Instagram in the chat. Um, Kyle and I are both part of a Facebook group, stay active DMV, where you can ask us questions about fitness or health or anything like that. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. It was awesome for you guys coming out. I hope you guys were finding some information that you could take out of this. Um, and if you take anything out of it, just stay active, like don't overthink it, work out, exercise, run, walk, push-ups, whatever it is, just work out. Do something. Something's always better than nothing. 1% every day. That's there you it. go. All right, guys. Thank you all for coming. And